Okay, we are um, happy to have um, uh, Uya um, Fields there with us from the University of Haifa. Uh, his title is Azumaya Algebra, admitting just one type of involution. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to, to thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to speak here. And let me start by saying that uh, this talk, uh, I mean, the, the title falls under the context of a broader uh, question. So let me state it uh, first, uh, which is the following. So let F be a uh, field and let G H1 and H2 be uh, linear algebraic groups over F. And let there be some morphisms like this uh, between these groups. And the question is, I don't know if you can name them, phi and psi. Um, so question, is there a G torsor extending from an H1 torsor and not from an H2 torsor. So I guess uh, a torsor uh, is a variety on which G acts. If there is a quotient, uh, it, the action is free. So let's say G torsor over some, over some uh, variety. So you can plug here whatever three groups you like, and most chances are that nobody will know how to answer this unless the answer is obvious. It's obvious if there is a morphism this way, uh, but otherwise it's a very difficult question. And today uh, I'm gonna talk about a special case uh, of this question, which is the title, which can be restated as uh, the following. So we have PGLN, which is the projective general linear group. And here we have PON, the projective orthogonal group. And here we have PSPN, so, so and it's even. And they're gonna swap places also. So we can also swap them. And this case of the question is actually equivalent to the uh, title, uh, to the question in the title. And this can be this problem of finding a, P a PGLN torsor coming from PON but not from PSPN or vice versa is equivalent to finding an Azumaya algebra with just one type of involution. So I'll talk about this plus a refinement, which I'll explain. Uh, so let me now move to the uh, more elementary language of Azumaya algebras. So let me first recall what is an Azumaya algebra. So let R be a commutative ring. Rings are commutative in the stock. Uh, with two invertible, it's going to be one of those talks of the good characteristic. And uh, just uh, an Azumaya, okay, an R algebra A is called Azumaya of degree. And if there exists a faithfully flat ring extension R1 over R such that um, A tensor R1 over R is isomorphic to the algebra of N by N matrices. So it's something that becomes matrices over some good extension. In this case, the good extension is a faithfully flat extension. So notice that if we take R to be a field, and for instance, take R1 to be the algebraic closure, then this recovers the definition of a central simple algebra, right? So, so essentially Azumaya uh, over a field is just a central simple algebra. And I would also like to talk about involutions. So uh, let's consider an involution sigma from A to A. An, an R linear involution. So it's 
Uh, but this is the usual definition of an involution, sigma of x, y, sigma y, sigma x, and sigma of x plus y is sigma of x plus sigma of y. And this is involuntary, involuntary, sorry. Um, and a few examples, uh, maybe a few examples which I would like to note. Some very basic examples of an Azumaya, well, of Azumaya algebras with involution are the following. So we can have uh, the algebra of n by n matrices over R. This is evidently an Azumaya algebra. And with the uh, transpose involution. Okay, that's not, that's a very elementary example. And another example is that uh, if n is even, so let's say that n is equal to k, we can have the so-called standard symplectic involution. So that is given if I, if I take, uh, if I write my matrix, matrices as block matrices of k by k, of two k by k, two by two k by k matrices. And I apply S here. And this is given by uh, D transpose, A transpose, negative B transpose, negative C transpose here. This is the so-called uh, standard <coughs> symplectic involution. And another interesting example is that if we have, if A is a quaternion uh, Azumaya algebra, by which I mean that the degree of A is two. So recall that uh, A is of degree N if it becomes N by N matrices uh, after some faithfully flat extension, um, then it has a standard involution. I'm gonna just call denoted by sigma, which is given by sigma of X equals to the reduced trace of a of x minus x. So that this is always an involution if the algebra is a quaternion algebra. Only then. Um, okay, so there is a, a nice fact which uh, let me state the following fact. Okay, so if f is a field, so fact is that if A sigma is a central simple algebra over a field F and sigma from A to A is an F involution, i.e. an involution of the first kind, then let's assume that two is uh, invertible, of course, then exactly one of the following. Hold. Uh, the first option is that if I go to the algebraic closure, then this turns out to be isomorphic to my first example with the transpose. And in this case, we say that sigma is orthogonal. And the second option, so this is either this or this and never both, is that this will be isomorphic to my field with the standard symplectic involution. And this is possible only if n is even, in which case we say that sigma is a symplectic. And this generalizes to rings in a very uh, straightforward manner. So just generalize to rings. Uh, so if A sigma is Azumaya, uh, an Azumaya algebra with uh, involution, well, with an R involution, then we call sigma orthogonal if there exists a faithfully flat ring extension 
such that, well, a R1 sigma R1 is matrices over R1 with the transpose involution and we call sigma symplectic if there exists every same such that in the end we get the standard symplectic involution and n has to be even in this case and i should say if r is connected then that's all the possibilities uh, but it's not so trivial uh, so this is why i'm not saying that either this or this should hold and <clears throat> oops okay so what's the oh <laughs> what's the connection to the uh to what i just erased <laughs> Uh, so it's actually PGLN, the PGLN torsors over spec R are actually in a, in a categorical equivalence with a degree and Azumaya algebras, degree and Azumaya algebras. And well, PON torsors over spec R are in one to one correspondence with. Uh, degree n Azumaya algebras with orthogonal evolution and PSPN, n is even here, PSPN torsors over spec R are in bijection to a degree uh, n Azumaya algebras with a symplectic involution. So this is how what I said it in the beginning relates to uh, the title. So essentially, I, I want to find uh, so finding an Azumaya algebra with just one type of involution is essentially uh, saying that I want to find the PGL and torsor extending from this group and not from that or the other way around. Okay, so I need to let's let's say uh, over fields we have the following folklore uh, theorem which says that if A is a central simple algebra over a field F uh, of even degree, then A has uh, an orthogonal involution if and only if A has a symplectic Involution and both conditions actually are equivalent, provided that the degree is even to uh, the Brouwer class of A being of uh, order two in the Brouwer group. That's a theorem of Albert. But this this is actually much more elementary, and uh, you 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 it's you just conjugate. You can just take an orthogonal involution and conjugate to a symplectic one, and vice versa. So now we can ask: Is the same true over uh, rings? And okay, so so maybe question. So what about <laughs> what about uh, Azumaya algebras uh, of uh, even degree over uh, rings? So this is a whole line of uh, research. You could say this fails. <laughs> Uh, you, you would expect it to fail, and it does fail. So it fails. And let me say, okay, so the answer is kind of, uh, so this, uh, this is false. And what it'll show, what I want to tell you about today, that it's actually as false as it could be. But let me say what, what is known. And well, the answer is not, not much is known, but uh, not probably mostly because nobody cared. Uh, but what is known is the following. So let me uh, make some kind of a chart. So source. Uh, and maybe properties of A and 
Does it have a symplectic involution? Does it have an orthogonal involution? So the earliest such example, which I found is in Knus, Knus's book, uh, Quadratic and Hermitian Forms Over uh, Rings. Uh, it's from 1991. I'm not sure where this example came from, if it was quoted or it is by Knus. Uh, you really, it's very difficult to find this is a very long book, but it's in section five, it, it, chapter five, section three, five point three. And he constructs algebras of degree four, uh, which do not have symplectic involutions and have orthogonal involutions. The next example, uh, which I was, which I'm aware of, uh, is the, the ring is uh, what? The ring is, uh, it has to satisfy some properties. It's not so simple. And uh, mostly the, I think that the card group has to be trivial. It uses some invariants of low, de of low degree uh, algebras, low degree Azumai algebras. The question was, what, what was what's the base ring? So I, I cannot tell you. Uh, yeah, mo most of these examples are gonna be this way. You, you, I won't be able to write down the base ring. We, we can just prove that they exist. And the next example is due to Susan uh, uh, Pamplun uh, from 2003 in a paper titled Involutions of uh, Composition Algebras. And she gives example of, examples of quaternion algebras. That's the case degree A equals two. Uh, they always have a symplectic involution, right? They all, this is what I said at the beginning of the talk. They always have symplectic involution and they don't have an orthogonal one. And there is a paper by Usher Owell, myself and Ben Williams from 2019, where we also deal with the case degree A equals two, but we add a twist and that is the index. So we give examples where the index is one and we give examples where the index is two. So we're somehow able to defer uh, to refine this. And in both cases, it must have a symplectic involution and it doesn't have an orthogonal uh, involution. And in that paper, so in that paper, so there was a, there, there was a conjecture made in that paper. So the, in that paper, we actually did the main issue. The main uh, content of that paper was uh, constructing a whole, a different type of example, uh, but which is the, could be the subject of another talk. But in that paper, a conjecture was made and it's kind of gives the most general variant of this. Uh, it predicts uh, that for essentially every degree and every index, you should have such examples. And so let, let me write it like this. So let M, be a positive integer and uh, another integer such that uh, two to the m divides n uh, and n is even. Then, so one is that if n is greater than or equal to one, then exist some Azumaya uh, algebra a with uh, some Azumaya algebra with degree equals n um, and index equals two to the m with um, with an ortho with a symplectic involution and no orthogonal involution. It's kind of the extreme of that. And the second thing, the second part of the conductor is the counterpart of this. Um, yeah, it can't be zero because the degree has to be positive. <laughs> so that is the, the, the question was why is an, n is at least uh, one? I should write, okay. Uh, okay, I could have written it there. Uh, Yeah, I should say, okay. Uh, I will say a few remarks about that after I write the second case. So case number two 
is that if n is at least uh, four, then, um, oh, why did I write it again? Yeah, this is superfluous. Sorry, that is superfluous. Yeah, at the end, <laughs> yeah. If n is greater than four, then exists an Azumaya algebra of a degree n and index equals two to the m with uh, symplectic involution and no orthogonal involution. Um, so a few quick uh, remarks. What? Yeah, I, I, I was confused with an orthogonal and no symplectic. Uh, and no symplectic. So maybe the first thing I should say is that if n equals two, we always have a symplectic involution. So here I have to require that n is at least four. So there is no choice. And this and remarks is that uh, if and as so, okay, maybe I should say the index of A is the greatest common divisor of the degrees of B as B ranges over the Brouwer class of A. If it was a central simple algebra, then it would be the degree of the division algebra in that class. For Azumai algebras, there is in general no uh, representative of a minimal uh, degree. So we just take the GCD. Uh, that was open for a long time. There is a uh, representative of minimal degree, but it's not true. This is due to uh, Williams and Antio. Um, and if A has an involution, uh, well, I should say R involution, then the index of A is a power of two. So restricting to a power of two, uh, was uh, nece is necessary, okay? So th those are two facts which I sh which I should specify. And theorem is that uh, th so this is kind of a work in progress, and so maybe I should put quote unquote. But I I've written it down. Hopefully there are no mistakes. <laughs> uh, but uh, it will take time to get to the archive. Theorem is that um, a conjecture one is true and conjecture two is true if uh, four divides n so the case n equals six for instance uh is open so we we, we couldn't do that um so this gets as bad as you can hope for uh, which is what you would expect in true in truth so so the if we go back to the state with this table. Uh, so essentially every degree and every index can appear as long as the degree is divisible by four in the, uh, this is the, what, did I, what I wanted to say. And now in the remaining time, I would like to tell you a bit about the proof of this. Questions so far? Okay. Um, actually, this is useful. Um, so I'll keep it. Okay, so how does the proof uh, of this work? Oh, I should say oh, uh, a byproduct. Okay, this is a maybe I should. Byproduct of the proof is that, uh, okay, so for every n divisible by four, uh, there exists a ring R, a projective module. Um, and a symmetric bilinear form B from P, symmetric non degenerate bilinear, as unimodular uh, bilinear form like this, but uh, such that such that there is no anti. A symmetric bilinear form p prime from p times p 
to R. So there is a module which supports a symmetric bilinear form, symmetric non-degenerate bilinear form, but no not anti-symmetric uh, non-degenerate uh, bilinear form. And the same with symmetric and anti-symmetric exchanged. And you don't need the uh, degree, of, uh, you only need n equals e, n is even here. Okay, so what goes into the proof of this? Huh? Sorry? What non degenerate, the question was what is non degenerate? It means that the induced map from P to HOM. PR, which is defined by X maps to B of X something is an isomorphism. It's regular or unimodular. There are a number of names in the literature. Yes. Um, I wrote on and I evidently meant no. <laughs> that is a type uh, in real time typo. Yeah. Writing on the board. I do typos when I write on the board, so I apologize. <clears throat> okay, so about the proof. Um, there are three things that go into this, and the first is to convert to a question about torsors. The second is to use a generic construction, uh, the so-called diversal torsors. So it's a general uh, a generalization of versal torsors, which was introduced by uh, myself, Zinovi Reichstein, Uh, and Ben Williams in a very recent paper. And we use, I use this to reduce to the uh, index equals one case. So that's the case where the Brouwer class of the SMI algebra in question is trivial. And the third case is to use topological. The, the third step is to use topological obstruction theory to solve uh, the in the uh, index equals one case. So that's the case of Azumai algebras with trivial uh, Brouwer class. So I will, I have time to tell you about this and that that's what I'm about to do. So because the thing is, if I want to control the index, I cannot just take I don't know, a generic, some kind of a very general PO and those torsor because the index would be typically BN of the Azumai algebra uh, in question. So I have to do something else. And the solution is, uh, it's a kind of a trick, but uh, I like this trick. So, uh, so about one. So let, let's take, uh, so we work over uh, the complex numbers. And let's consider the following uh, algebraic groups. So for every, ah, okay, so I'm sorry, yeah. So if you're correct, so if n is a power of two, this is true, but if n is not a power of two, then the index would typically be the largest power of two dividing n, yes. So let me write r equals two to the m. That would be uh, useful. And let me introduce uh, two groups, uh, g n r, which will be, uh, so n, n is of course, n is even. g n r is going to be the uh, symplectic group times g l r divided by the diagonal copy of mu two. And likewise, you can define h n r, which is the orthogonal group times 
GLR divided by the diagonal copy of mu2. So what is, so and both groups have a natural morphism to uh, PGLR, uh, sorry, to PGLN. <laughs> and each of these groups admits, uh, you just project onto the uh, SPN or the ON component and mod out even more. And here is a fact. Let me just stick to this group, okay? So what do G and R uh, torsors classify? So they are in bijection, in, well, in equivalence, I should say in categorical equivalence, in equivalence with triples A sigma P, well, forcers over a ring R or spec R, they're in, in equivalence with triples such that A is uh, Azumaya uh, of degree N over R, sigma from A to A is a symplectic evolution. So that, that is not trivial. Okay, I should say proposition. It's a better uh, statement. And P is a left A module of rank, R rank, uh, N times R. So there is this new component. And if I, moreover, if I kind of take a, So if I take a G and R torsor and I kind of change it into a PGL N torsor. So this corresponds to a triple A sigma P. Turns out that this thing is the same as just forgetting sigma N. But note that A is going to be Brouwer equivalent to the endomorphism ring of P over A. And that is going to be, because P has a rank NR, this is going to be an Azumaya algebra of degree R. R is two to the M. So that means that the index of A is divisible by two to the M. So, if I use these torsors, I get a bound on the index. I could get the right index. And okay, the index could be much smaller. And the idea is that we really use, so we use, a, let's say, highly a diversal G and R or H and R torsor. And maybe I should just finish with the definition of what is a diversal and that they exist. And by that, I will finish. I mean, knowing that they exist is not enough. Uh, we need to prove the desired properties. So definition, um, this is uh, okay, due to a uh, in the paper with Zinova uh, Reichstein and Ben Williams. So let G be a linear algebraic group over a field F and, and let T to X be a G torsor. Uh, this G torsor is called D reversal. Here D is at least zero. If for every other G torsor um, T1 to X1 with this thing being affine uh, of finite type over F, some affine scheme, uh, there exists, a, oh, and of course of dimension at most D, that's the most important thing, then there exists a specialization. There's a specialization, uh, T1, here I have T2X, and 
here I have T12X1. So there's going to be this kind of specialization, and this is going to be a pullback diagram where the uh, for, uh, vertical arrows are G torsors. So this is going to be G equivariant. There are many ways to characterize that. So if you look at this, this generalizes versal torsors, which are roughly the case D equals zero, except we don't, you, I mean, for versal torsors, you require uh, just fields and you don't require finite type. And you could think, why should these things exist? But theorem uh, versal torsors, or maybe you should say diversal torsors, exist and i should this is unpublished yet but uh, same but with affine base so the base scheme x could be taken to be uh, this base scheme could be taken to be affine and moreover you can remove the finite type uh, so it still works so the construction of these Azumai algebras without with one type of involution is going to involve these highly versal uh, torsors. Okay, uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, okay. Okay. Let let me repeat the question. The question was that is there some assumption on the base ring which would imply that one type of involution implies the other, and I mean we know that for fields. And the question is the answer. I I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. I, I, maybe it could even fail for one-dimensional rings, Dedekind domains, for silly reasons. But it's not so easy to show, so I don't know. So even for one dimensional rings, we don't know. Okay. Um, okay, our, our next speaker is um, Ami Brown from University of Haifa. He will talk about um, um, P groups and the polynomial ring of invariance question. Uh, this talk will be online broadca broadcast to this um, um, CP. lecture hall, but also around the world. <laughs> <laughs> לא רואה את הוידאו שלי. ציפי זה לא... טוב, בואו נראה מה קורה פה. כן. אני לא... הבעיה שלי זה... אני לא מצליח להגדיל את המסך פה. הכל דלוק, שר, אני עושה פה שר. לא. Just a minute. Just a minute, I'll open it again. I have a... Just a minute. <coughs> no. Okay. Okay.
Stop the share and uh, do it again, but do share screen and not just to the browser. Well, I did it. Okay, let's try again. Just a minute. Okay, finally. <clears throat> okay, can you? Know, I don't. I'm not sure that one can see me in a minute. No way, Muti. Why, why? I don't see myself. So let's see. Why is that the case? Can you see me? Yes, we see you. We see you. Okay. I can see myself, but it's fine. As long as you see me and see my pretty pictures. Okay. Should I start? Okay. Uh, so good uh, afternoon. Good morning, I guess, for the foreigners abroad. <clears throat> uh, this is, of course, uh, uh, our yearly Amitur Symposium, which I'm very glad that I was invited to give a talk on. Uh, as you uh, bear with me, because uh, this is my first Zoom talk, so I might do a bit, a bit clumsy about it. Um, <clears throat> of course, uh, I knew Amitsu very well, mathematically. We, I did research in PI rings, which was part, one of one of his areas of research. And uh, of course, he was a teacher of mine in undergraduate. So I have many other things to say about him, but today I'll talk mathematically and I'll talk about a problem which, doesn't, which wasn't in his mathematical landscape, so to speak. And this is, of course, the title. Uh, so let me start in a minute. Okay, so what we are having here is a finite group G <coughs> inside GLV, where V is a finite dimensional vector space over a field F. Uh, the characteristic of the field is P. S V is the symmetric algebra on V. By this I mean, uh, okay, well, this is a polynomial ring. Uh, for example, uh, how to uh, realize it, take any basis of uh, V, X1 to Xn, and then S uh, V is the polynomial ring generated by X1 to Xn uh, over the field F. And G being inside a GLV, uh, <clears throat> of course, implies that the V is a G module. So the action of G on V can be extended naturally to a finite, to an action of a finite group of automorphism, namely G is a finite group of automorphism uh, on SV. Okay, what is the basic problem? <clears throat> Excuse me. When is SV upper G a polynomial ring as well? Um, what, now, what is SV upper G? This is a fixed ring of G, namely all the elements in SV, which are fixed by each element of G. <clears throat> this uh, apparently is an old problem in variant theory. Uh, the basic result is as follows. Uh, this is a theorem which is called Schaeffer, Todd, Chevalier, and Serr. And the assumption are as follows. Suppose P is prime to the order of G. Then SV upper G is a polynomial ring if and only if G is generated by pseudo reflection. Uh, okay, what are pseudo-reflections? Uh, G, an element of G is a pseudo-reflection if on V, if the dimension of the kernel of G minus one is one less than the dimension of V. <clears throat> Note that being a pseudo-reflection, a little g on V, it is the same. It's equivalent to say that it is, is a pseudo-reflection on V star, which is the dual basis of V over F. There are two types of pseudo-reflections. The first one is a diagonalizer. Namely, there is a, for a suitable basis, G as the presentation of a diagonal matrix where all the entries but one are, uh, are one and the remaining one is an element of the field. The other, uh, the other uh, okay. In this case, if G is finite, this uh, uh, remaining element C is a root of unity. The other, uh, a possibility for being a transaction is a matrix of the form presented uh, 
in, in front of you, namely, these are ones along the diagonal, zeros under the diagonal, zeros above the diagonal, and uh, the only uh, non-zero elements are in the first row, for example. Again, uh, this is, uh, you can always find the basis of V such as G is represented in this way, in this matrix form. Note that uh, a transvection only exists if P divides the order of G. Uh, the point is, uh, well, uh, let me not elaborate on this. Okay, let me go back to the previous question. I, I'll do some uh, historical uh, remarks on this, on this uh, theorem. Uh, I have a point in this, not only telling the history. Okay, Schaeffer then taught in 1954, proved the theorem uh, for the complex numbers. The method of proof was rather, uh, it goes as follows. They found the list of all complex finite groups, which, which are generated by, by pseudo collections. And uh, this is not an easy task. It requires uh, work with, uh, involving combinatorics and of course group theory. Uh, once they had the list, they realized that for each uh, such G in the list, SV upper G is a polynomial ring. Okay, what was the, the contribution of Chevalet one year later? He showed for the case of F being field, being the real numbers, how to avoid the previous classification. So you don't have to go through a list. Uh, now the, to the contribution of Ser. Uh, this is uh, somewhat uh, cumbersome. What's written in the books is that Ser uh, showed how to uh, extend the Chevalet argument to the case where the field is the complex numbers. And in this way to avoid the, the entire classification of Sheffer then taught. I couldn't find a, a precise uh, reference for this actual step. Well, the first uh, written a version which I found by Ser, uh, this was in 1968, about more than 10 years later. And uh, he extended it not, not only to the case of P being prime to the order of G, but also, uh, it, well, he did some more in this paper, we shall talk shortly, but he extended at least the theorem to the, to the setup which I just presented previously. And again, no, uh, no, uh, uh, restriction uh, on the characteristic apart from the being prime to the order of G. So this is the theorem, the way it's, uh, it's, it's being related now to them. There is some injustice in these uh, attributions. In fact, there is a prehistory to this story. Uh, in uh, 1934, uh, Coxeter actually proved, he found the classification of all uh, pseudo reflection groups uh, over the reals. And he also realized that, uh, that the fixed ring SV upper G is, is a polynomial ring in all of these cases. I think that his name wasn't put in the, into this uh, story because the classification over R is, much, uh, is a much weaker, it's much easier task to do than what uh, Sheffer and Todd did. And uh, this is the reason his name is, uh, is uh, out of this, uh, List, but maybe not unjust this one. Okay. In this uh, 1968 paper by uh, Sir, he did some more. He actually gave some necessary condition for the ring SV upper G to be a polynomial ring involving, uh, and now, and this is important to, uh, to make, uh, to, to say, that uh, no restriction on the characteristic. So the first implication, I, I was a bit in, in, in inaccurate in this statement, but let me, let me just say, okay, what is the theorem by Sir? The theorem by Sir is that SV, if SV upper G is a polynomial ring, this implies the G generated a pseudo reflection and no restriction on, on, on P. Uh, the second implication, is the following. Again, if SV upper G is a polynomial ring, then SV upper GU, GU is now is a subgroup of G, defined by being the, what's called the, the element, uh, the fixed, well, how do we call it? 
the fixator of U, and what does it mean? All the element in G, which are fixing each element in uh, capital U, where capital U is a subspace of V star. You run on all these subspaces, you, you collect all these finite uh, subgroups, and you and the conclusion is if SV is upper G is a polynomial ring, then SVGU is a polynomial ring as well. Now, what was I, what is the fact which I wasn't that accurate? In uh, Serve's 1968 paper, only the first implication was appeared. However, both implications appeared in about exactly the same time inside Bourbaki as, as advanced exercises. Uh, maybe Sarah didn't think that the second implication is of uh, importance as the first one, and therefore he didn't put it in the actual paper. But people attribute this one to him, and uh, I, I, I take that he did it. Okay, so let's look again in these two conditions. The first one already appeared at the first, uh, already when we discussed the first theorem. Uh, the second one is new to us. And uh, historical remark, the second implication was firstly proved by Robert Steinberg uh, in the case the field is being uh, the complex number. For me, maybe this uh, two uh, uh, implication, uh, suggests sort of a, a shift of importance, namely, maybe Sarah wasn't really thinking that the second implication of importance, for me, I, well, not only me, but people were realizing that maybe two is, is, is maybe not more important, but definitely as, as important as the first restriction. Namely, SV upper G, from this, uh, the upshot of this story is that we have two reasonable uh, uh, restrictions on a polynomial of on SV upper G to be a polynomial ring. Uh, going somewhat historically, Nakajima, Abuisa Nakajima in 1985 considered the case where G is a P group, but with, with a very severe restriction, namely where the field is the prime field. So here is the theorem. Suppose P is uh, uh, equal to uh, P is equal to the prime field, then G again is a finite P group. Then SV upper G is a polynomial ring if and only if V has a basis, Z1 to Zn, such that each of uh, these, uh, uh, the first one, FZ1 plus FZI is a G sub module for each I. Uh, and the second uh, uh, condition for this basis is that the order of each orbit orbit of Z1, Z2, and Zn with respect to G, if you, uh, if you look, multiply the orbits, then you get exactly the order of G. Let me just uh, recall uh, that condition one says really that uh, V uh, is a flag of G modules, and this uh, existence of uh, basis of V uh, with this property is, uh, co is true for every finite uh, P group, uh, regardless if the field F is, uh, uh, being FP or not. The issue is really condition two. And, uh, and in this theorem, the sufficient of the condition of these conditions are not uh, relevant to the case F being FP. Namely, once you have these two conditions, then SV upper G is a polynomial ring. The issue is the second one. It does all, namely the necessity of condition two. It does all only uh, if F is equal to the prime field. Um, I did put this one uh, uh, in, in after, after uh, the previous uh, theorem by Serre um, because of historical reasons. Uh, it doesn't fit into my narrative of the story, but I think you deserve the the credit for this, by the way, it's a difficult result, namely at least verifying the condition two is, 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 a, is a sufficient condition in this case. But now comes something which I, which is in the line of, uh, in, in, in sort of fits in the narrative of my story. And this is a result by Kemper, uh, Gregor Kemper and Gunther Marley in 1967, uh, which says as follows, suppose V is also an irreducible G model then SV upper G is a polynomial ring if and only if 
And uh, I essentially write the same way. These are the same, same condition which I said previously. G is generated by pseudo reflections. And SV GU is a polynomial ring for each U inside V star with the dimension of U is uh, at least one. But observe, it's an important restriction. V is irreducible. The proof required some corrections uh, which, uh, uh, which were added by 2000. So to sum it up in this respect, so necessary, necessary condition turn out to be sufficient uh, once V is also an, an irreducible G mod. So here is the main conjecture or question depends on your, uh, well, depends on your choice or uh, the, question, the, the, the question which I would like to raise as a, or a conjecture, are cells necessary condition also sufficient for an arbitrary G module V? And uh, so let me elaborate a bit of, uh, on this. Uh, the proof of Kemper Male, uh, for, uh, which followed earlier works of Nakajima, used classification theorems for finite irreducible groups. Uh, in particular, results by Zaleski and Sereskin, by Wagner and by Cantor. Uh, to be more uh, specific, the last paper uh, by Cantor, uh, Bill Cantor, uses some difficult results by Ashbacher. Uh, Ashbacher, I think, to spell it correctly, to pronounce it correctly. Um, for me, it's a bit uh, annoying because I can't really verify this result. I uh, sort of I uh, have to take them on, uh, on uh, sort of sort of a black box results. And, well, this is life. I, I have to admit, but uh, I'm not uh, happy about it. But if you uh, coming back to this, uh, why do I tell? I'm telling you this. So in principle, what they did, they used the same strategy as uh, Shepard and Todd. They uh, used Kemper and Marley, uh, a list of all irreducible, irreducible meaning V is being irreducible, G module generated by pseudo reflections. And they check one by R1. And the one which were, uh, uh, the fixed link wasn't the polynomial link was because condition two. Uh, it was violated. This is the way the theorem was conceived. Uh, with such a method, one may be discouraged from believing in such a conjecture. In fact, and uh, I had two result, uh, two discussion with Gregor Kemper on this issue, and it seems that he leans towards the uh, he leans uh, towards the side of. Uh, he believes probably, I'm not saying it, he didn't say it explicitly, but probably believes that this conjecture may not be true in its full generality. Um, I have a more flexible uh, attitude, uh, and this is because uh, uh, several reasons, I, I, but let me, start, let me start now and talk about new results, which were uh, suggested by, or at least were initiated by uh, by this uh, conjecture or by Kemper's Male or Kemper slash Male uh, theorem. And these are the, and uh, the, the impetus was, uh, to start with, was uh, rather trivial. For P groups, such a conjecture by, uh, is actually trivially true because one has always a subspace U inside V star of dimension one. And, uh, and with the extra property, the GU, the fixator of the capital U is G. Well, in this case, of course, uh, you're given the, the fact that S the upper G is, is, is a polynomial. Now, what was the issue which I was, uh, which I was uh, getting out of this trivial result? I was uh, thinking maybe one can uh, relax or weaken a bit condition two, which I'll just go back and remind you, and uh, ask for less. I should, one may, shouldn't run on all these uh, subspaces of V star 
of dimension at least one, uh, maybe one can work with a smaller uh, family of subspaces and get uh, a useful result for P groups, only P group. This is the subject matter of my uh, talk here. So here is the result. So you have a finite P group, P is the characteristic, and uh, this is theorem B. I'll, I'll come back to theorem A pretty soon. And the restriction here is the dimension of V is at least four. And as V upper G is uh, polynomial ring, if and only if you have two conditions. The first one is, is that SV GU is a polynomial ring for each subspace U inside V star with the dimension of U being two running on all of these. The second condition uh, is uh, that SV upper G is a coin Macaulay ring. Observe that no finite generation by, uh, by pseudo reflections are, uh, is required. This, this requirement, namely condition one in Kemper Valley or in the conjecture, is uh, superfluous in this setup. Uh, maybe I'll have time to talk about why this is not necessary, why, why one doesn't need it here. Uh, to emphasize what we are doing here, I said it before. If G is a P group, uh, you have a flag of sub, sub modules of V such that uh, V can be given uh, according to the flag you're seeing in front of you, where the adjacent quotients are exactly uh, dimension one. V, uh, so V of course in this case is uh, as far as possible for being irreducible. So in the previous, theor so the previous theorem, uh, is uh, sits on the opposite side of the, in, of the scale in comparison to Kemper and Mahler's theorem where V was uh, irreducible. Um, okay. Let me say a few work about uh, dimension three, which was, uh, which was uh, uh, omitted or wasn't discussed upon in, the, in, in theorem one, in theorem B. Uh, the reason uh, I, I, I have to, one reason that I have to uh, avoid dimension three in here because it's not true. Uh, theorem B is not true in dimension three. So what is true in dimension three is as follows. Uh, G again is a finite P group with dimension V being three and P is the characteristic. And then SV upper G is a polynomial ring if and only if G is generated by, by transvections. Let me just say uh, that uh, this is exactly very much like the theorem by Schaeffer Todd de Chevalier and uh, Serre's theorem. However, the proof is different. It is of computational nature. At least one proof, I, the first proof and probably the better proof I have is of computational nature. Uh, I should just mention that if G is a finite P group, transvection is, say, pseudo reflection are transvections. There are no for P groups and diagonalizable. All of them are transvection. Uh, the second remark I would like to say about theorem A is that it, it's it is important in the proof of theorem B. Uh, to be more precise, a detailed version of theorem A, if I have time, I may hint upon it is being used. Uh, okay, I have uh, had this definition. I have this notion of Cohen Macaulay. I said it already. I, I, I should have said it after the Sheffer taught Chevalier and Cher, Serres, but, but I, I guess I didn't say it. But uh, I should say as follows. Okay, here's the definition of uh, being Cohen Macaulay. A commutative affine B, ring B, namely being generated by finite number of elements over a field is called Macaulay if there is a polynomial subring C of B, such as B is both finally generated and free over as a C module. The issue here is being free. Being finally generated, this is a standard result. Well, it is letter by letter normalization, but the, the, the key point here being Cohen uh, uh, Macaulay is that you have that B is uh, a free C module as well. It is not the standard definition, uh, but it definitely illustrates the fact that the B being a polynomial ring uh, implies that being is called Macaulay. 
Um, okay. I guess, uh, let me see, let me assess, uh, um, maybe I should say first, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to some facts about the proof of this one, but I would like to say some um, about the general fact about the proof. The proof didn't, didn't, doesn't really use any uh, homological algebra, which is somewhat unusual nowadays uh, on, uh, in commutative algebra. And uh, the language of the, of the proof, of course, is commutative algebra. Um, so well, I, this is the nature of the only proof which I know. Um, the proof, uh, the second maybe good proof, a good point about the proof that it constructs inductively the generators of SG upper G. So we okay. Uh, the I would like to uh, mention uh, a geometric formulation of theorem B. Uh, it goes as follows. So G again is the finite P group. Dimension of V is being uh, is at least four, and uh, S V upper G is coin Macaulay. So SV is a polynomial ring, if and only if SV upper G is coin Macaulay, and instead of condition being uh, uh, what I had before about the subgroup GU, I would like I, I replace it by the condition that the dimension of the non-smooth locus of SV upper G is uh, at most one. Uh, for the one uh, which are not easy about smooth, smooth locus, you just when F is uh, and algebraically close, or maybe I should say perfect, then what I'm talking about is the non-regular, the singular locus of SV upper G. So the dimension should be at, at most one. Uh, the remark which I would like to say about this is uh, that this is of course a geometric formulation, in fact, close to, to uh, uh, well, uh, but uh, the proof is purely algebraic. I don't, uh, no, and a geometric proof, and I don't really believe that there is a geometric proof. If uh, people will ask me, I'll, uh, I might elaborate or at least indicate why I think so. Okay. Um, let me go back a bit and use some time to discuss some part of the proofs of the proof. Well, sort of an indication what type of an argument one uses in this business. And uh, 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 maybe I should say one more thing, which is not written on the board. I, I, I don't, I think I missed it. Uh, but I would like to remind you that if when G is, uh, the order of G is prime to P, uh, this of course, this condition is, uh, people are aware of it uh, all, of, all the time. Um, uh, how does it uh, surface here? For groups which are non-modular, namely when the order of the group is prime to the characteristic, the fixed ring SV upper G is always called Macaulay. This is the result by Oxter and Egon, rather easy result. And uh, it's sort of hidden in this, once you take such a, a group, you don't think about it anymore, but it is, it always appears somehow. In characteristic, uh, in the case where I'm dealing with, where P divides the order of G most of the time, and in my case, P is a, G is a P group, there are finite groups which are generated by uh, pseudo reflections, by transvections, but as the upper G is not even called Macaulay. And uh, the first results I know, I guess, are due to Nakajima and also by Kemper and uh, I guess by others, I, I, I didn't check carefully the, 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 the literature, but I should say that some of them are very classical, namely SN for P, SN when, when N is uh, big enough and the characteristic divides N uh, uh, and when you act on the proper Cartan uh, subalgebra of SLN, you get something of this nature. Namely, the fixed ring is not even called Macaulay. I think the characteristic should be at least uh, seven. So the coin macaulay property of the fixed ring is, is always holds in 
when the characteristic is prime to, to the order of G. And from this point, from this respect, the appearance of this SV upper G in my, uh, in my theorem is, uh, is, appears at least to me more natural now. Okay. Fine. Okay. Let me say a few words about the proof. I'm not sure I'll have enough time. I think I have six more minutes to go, but I'm not entirely sure. I'm not sure that I, I may be mistaken. Okay. Uh, I will uh, try to illustrate it in the case when the dimension of V is four. Uh, the proof, actually most of the bulk of the proof is uh, being uh, done when the field F is uh, perfect. If you want, when the field is, uh, is uh, algebraically closed. The shift to the general case requires other tools, and this is the place where the non smooth locus business appears, but I won't elaborate this. So, but, uh, so let me start a bit some, some uh, data on this, on this, how the proof uh, proceeds. So, one can always have a, a P, G is a P group, finite P group, you, have, you always have a one dimensional trivial submodulo. And one uh, set uh, quotient module, G, G module, to be uh, W. G acts linearly on W, but this action may not be faithful. And one sets H to be the, the kernel of G uh, from, from G to G restricted to W. This is, of course, a, a normal subring of G, but in fact, it's an elementary abelian P group. One can present it with respect to a suitable basis rather very, uh, very uh, precisely. I, I, I think I should have done it, but I didn't. And I don't have the ability to write on my PDF because of my, how should I say, infancy of presenting talks in Zoom. Uh, so the point is that this particular G, for this particular G, uh, Nakajima showed that SV uh, upper H is a polynomial ring. One of the generators is uh, V, which we started with, and there are three more generators, homogeneous element, and uh, their degree must be power of uh, P. And also, this is also standard, that the product of the degrees of all generators must be the order of H. Of course, the dimension of the degree of V is one, so it doesn't appear in this uh, presentation. Here is a key step. Here is a key step, which I call uh, this equality, which I call a reduction, and I'll say why. <laughs> <laughs> if you take the uh, SV upper G and you divide it by the prime ideal generated by V, uh, then you get, you get uh, the other, on the right hand side, a, uh, another fixed ring. The group with respect to which this is taken is G over H. The ring inside this bracket is SV upper H divided by the prime ideal generated by V inside SV upper H. This equality uh, is uh, uses condition one and two in a heavy way. This is a uh, uh, in some respect, although it's not, this is a major reduction one uses. And uh, maybe I'll have more time to say, uh, I don't think I'll have more time to say about it. But I would like to, to, to indicate why this is really a, a reduction. The, right, the, the ring in the right hand side, uh, what you take, you take SV upper G and you mod by the idea generated by VSVH. This is the polynomial ring generated by X2 bar, X3 bar, X4 bar. It's a sub polynomial ring of SW. W, remember, is a three dimensional quotient of V. The problem with, w, with, the, with this ring, Fx bar, X2 bar, X3 bar, X4 bar, that the degrees of the, of the generator may not be one or may not be equal. So the action of G over H on this polynomial ring, this is a polynomial ring, is not. Uh, is not linear. This is the cause of a major problem in this entire uh, project of proving my results. And I have to use all sorts of tricks to, to, 
to, uh, to somehow to overcome this difficulty. And uh, as I said uh, in the next line, that one can finish, one, one finishes, one can, well, the, the proof will be done at least in this case, if the right-hand side is a polynomial ring, because if you leave these two uh, three images inside S, V, upper G, and you add them to V, you got yourself four generator of S, V, upper G, and therefore this is a polynomial. However, I cannot prove that the right-hand side is a polynomial ring in the course of the proof. It only after showing that the, the end result, S, V, upper G is a polynomial ring, I can conclude that the right-hand side of this equality is a polynomial ring. Uh, this indicates the, the nature of the difficulty one is, 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 is uh, facing here. I have always, I have to keep track and, and go back always to SV upper G where I can, where G acts linearly and I can say something. I have to carry information back always to the linear setup, SV and G acting on it. However, G over H acts linearly and faithfully on the on the space uh, W and therefore on SW, the polynomial ring on W, the symmetric algebra of W. Oh, uh, and uh, I can use this fact that G over H acts linearly on this W to show that G uh, acts on, uh, G acts by transvection, G over H acts by transvection on W. And uh, okay. And here comes the, uh, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, am I, uh, am I, uh, do I have five more minutes? I think according to my watch, uh, what is your, uh, um, account of the time? I can't hear you. Let me stop for a minute. Um, uh, 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 maybe two more minutes. Um, That's it. Ha ha. Okay. You, you, okay. Okay. I have to cut my talk a bit shorter. Okay. So, so, oops. I now got it wrong. Two more minutes. Okay. So let me show where, where we. Okay, so I have been in here and how to use these facts. Uh, the key, another key issue is that I have to alter the generators of this SV upper H uh, into other generators, uh, uh, which are still generating SV upper H, but uh, with a, some, and finding some supplement elements of V, W, W, W4, such that V, W2, W2, W4 are a triangulating base, triangulating basis of the action of G on V, going back again to V. And the generators uh, minus uh, these WIs to the right powers are inside the idea generator inside uh, VSV. And this is really uh, crucial um, in my, uh, in my uh, proof because I'm acting on this ring, new ring now, SV, new, the same ring, SVH, upper H, VSV, upper H, which is now generated by three elements, W2 to the power of PE2, W3 bars, I'm sorry, I forgot, W3 bar PE to the, to the power of PE2, power three, E3, and W4, W4 bar P to the E4, and G over H acts on it. It's, it's an unlearned action, uh, but because of this uh, nature of the way it looks, the ring looks this way, and because <clears throat> G of, uh, the, this W bar, W3 bar, W4 bar is a triangular basis of W bar, I can uh, have a control of the degrees of the fixed ring. I won't elaborate the rest of it, but uh, what I am having, what the, I would just say that once I have these uh, SW, FW, 
bar A and B being the generators, I can lift them to the appropriate powers in inside SVG, add to it the element V, which I started with, and this, because of their degrees, which I, ca I kept carefully under control, the product of their degrees is exactly the order of the, of the group G, and this furnish the, 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 the generating set of, of SV upper G uh, being a polynomial ring. I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, any quick question or, okay, let's, let's move to our next uh, uh, speaker. It's a pleasure to, to have uh, Michael Larson from Indiana University, Bloomington. Um, he will uh, talk about almost polynomial identity. Hi, thank you. Um, and thank you very much uh, to the organizers for inviting me. It's really an honor uh, to speak at the uh, Amitsur uh, Amit Symposium, especially, um, I guess this is the 100th uh, anniversary of his birth. Um, I am still seeing on my screen the previous slides. I think maybe they'll go away if I share my screen. Let's try this. Uh, so I want to say, first of all, that uh, everything that I want to talk about today is uh, joint work um, with Annette. And uh, also, I, before I uh, talk about um, these uh, almost identities in, in the context of um, associative algebras, which is what I want to do today, uh, I want to say something about um, where this comes from, or at least where I imagine it comes from. Um, so associative identities in group theory, finite group theory. So let me begin with five eighths theorem, which I guess is, um, as far as I understand, is due to uh, Erdős and um, Turan. And it simply says that um, if two random elements of a finite group G commute with probability greater than five eighths, then G is commutative. And we could express this in terms of the number of commuting pairs, right? X, Y, such that the identity holds. So the, the condition is that this should be greater than five eighths times the number of commuting pairs. Um, and that implies that this um, is not just an almost identity, an identity which holds probabilistically, um, but actually a true identity on the group G. Now, um, a theorem which uh, discusses uh, somehow a similar issue, but, but, um, but it has a different flavor um, we, we look at the same uh, probability of commuting pairs. This is a theorem of Neumann. And it says the following. It says, uh, for all epsilon, uh, there exists n, positive integer, uh, such that if uh, the probability that pairs commute in a particular group G is greater than epsilon, then, okay, the conclusion is not that, that the group is commutative, because that isn't, that isn't always true, but that a different identity holds. Uh, and the identity is this, that if we take the commutator of x to the n and y to the n and put that to the nth power, then we always get one. So they, somehow the group is in some sense almost almost commutative, um, a, a slightly modified identity holds. Okay, so these 
these two theorems are sort of prototypes for me of, of things we would like to do. Um, let me mention um, one other situation in group theory where, where uh, results of this kind are known. Uh, so if instead of looking at commuting pairs, we look at the, the condition that the square of an element is, is one, the elements uh, uh, of order two or one, and if we look at the, the proportion of elements uh, satisfying this, this property, uh, if this is greater than square root of five eighths times the order of the group G, then, then in fact, every element, then every element is a square. And I think that this is a, is a theorem of Robinson. So this is sort of, um, this is like the, the five eighths theorem. The constant is a little different, but it's, it has the same flavor. Now, there's also a Neumann type uh, theorem, which is, um, which is due to Mann. And here again, the, you know, it's for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists n greater than zero, such that if the elements in G with x squared equal to one, the no total number of these is, is, is greater than epsilon times the order of the group, then, okay, we can't say that, that every element uh, squared is one, but, but there is some identity which holds. And interestingly, it's the same identity as before. So even though we started off with, uh, you know, with, with a, a different identity, um, which holds in a, some probabilistic sense, we ended up with the same identity over here, which I think is kind of an interesting fact. And we might ask the following questions, which kind of uh, generalize uh, these two kinds of theorems. So question one would say the following. So let, um, let W uh, be a word in the free group of degenerators. Uh, so we can think of, of W as being like the commutator or, or like X squared. Ah, I see this something in the chat. Uh, ah, somebody asks, epsilon is between zero and one. Yes, absolutely. Yes, I should have said that. Um, yeah, so if we start off with a word uh, and, and then there exists, um, there exists uh, epsilon greater than zero, such that if G is a finite group, And the inverse image of the identity of the group, of the uh, identity of G, has more than a one minus epsilon proportion. Okay, so again, if we're thinking about a word W, it will define a map from G to the D to G. And if, if with probability greater than one minus epsilon, we get the identity, uh, then, in fact, we always get the identity. W of, of uh, G to the D is just equal to E. It's supposed to be a question. I, I don't know what the answer is. I mean, I, I, I guess um, one could describe this as a conjecture. In fact, I think it, it, uh, I think it is a conjecture, uh, maybe a Dixon, um, but, but I, don't, I, I don't feel strongly enough about it that, that I would want to call it a conjecture. Uh, and then there's a, a, a version of the second kind of problem. So here we start off with uh, uh, a word D. And now the statement is that for all epsilon greater than zero, uh, there exists um, a new identity, maybe in a different number of variables, um, such that if G is a finite group, Finite group and uh, finite group, and uh, again uh, W of um, W W inverse of the identity now is greater than epsilon times G to the D. The probability is greater than epsilon um, that the, the word will evaluate to the identity that the word holds. Uh, then uh, w prime of g to the d is equal to the identity. And again, the, the, the 
point here is that this statement is supposed to be, I mean, this word w, w prime, yes, it may depend on, um, on epsilon as well as possibly on w, but it should not depend on g. Okay, so, so all of these, uh, um, I mean, I guess I phrase these questions as statements, but, but of course they're really questions, is, it, is this true? Um, so I think that these, I mean, to me, these, these sounds like, like if they are true, they sound like they're hard to prove. Um, on the other hand, uh, it seems like it might be easier to prove statements uh, of the same kind if instead of working uh, in the setting of groups, we switch to the uh, setting of associative algebras. Okay, so now that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to let K be a field. And let R from now on be an associative uh, uh, K algebra. And I want to now to talk about uh, associative polynomials. Uh, so uh, let P, say of x1 through xn, be a polynomial with coefficients in the field K, but a, the variables don't commute. This is, this is where my identities are going to live. And I'm going to be interested in the size of P inverse um, of zero. So I'm interested in, 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 in large P inverse of zero. Now, um, the most obvious way, ah, somebody just asked a question, let's see. Um, is it not, uh, it, it's not, not necessarily that the group um, divides N in question one. I'm not sure what n is in this question. Um, all right, so if uh, somebody wants to follow up, oh, uh, D. Um, so um, is it not necessary that the order of the group divides D? Um, no, I mean, D is, is just the number of variables. Maybe I didn't make this clear. So if I have a word, so for example, in the case of the commutator, D would be two. It's the number of variables. In the case of this x squared, the, the d would be one. Okay, so uh, p is now going to play the role that w played before. And I'm interested in the, in the case where, so okay, the, the most naive way of, of generalizing um, this would require r to be finite. So let's, um, let's ask the question in this form. So, so uh, let's ask now question one prime. So uh, uh, given P, does there exist epsilon greater than zero uh, such that if R is finite, which of course uh, necessitates that K is a finite field and also that R is finite dimensional over K. So I said if R is finite uh, uh, and the number, well, let's say the probability that, um, that P takes the value zero is greater than, than one minus epsilon. So you could express this in terms of the sizes of sets as saying this is greater than one minus epsilon times R to the power of the number of variables. And if this is true, uh, then uh, P is an identity. on R? That's the first question. Um, and the second question, again, by analogy to the group theory, uh, given P and epsilon, uh, does there exist Q? This is now a polynomial uh, in possibly a different number of variables. Um, and Q should not be, should not be identically zero, uh, such that if um, the probability that P is satisfied is greater than epsilon, then Q is 
always satisfied. Again, Q is allowed to depend on epsilon, but it should not depend on the ring. Uh, and so the situation is as follows. So, um, so a, a theorem um, uh, is that uh, question one has an affirmative answer. And in fact, this question, although, um, yeah, I mean, this question turns out to be surprisingly easy to answer. Um, and in fact, we can be quite, we can be quite explicit uh, about how big uh, epsilon has to be. So it's enough to take, enough to take epsilon equal two to the power of the minus the degree of the polynomial P. And the idea behind the proof is, um, uh, it, it's not very difficult. I mean, so the idea is, is um, regard um, regard R just as a k vector space, finite dimensional k vector space, and so when we have a map, P gives us a map from from R to the n to R. So, so I mean, this is given by so the the um, so this is just, you know, like k to the some vector space. I don't know k to the power of m n goes to k to the power of m. So it's just given by a vector of polynomials. So, so if this is not identically zero, uh, then there's some coordinate. Some coordinate in, in k to the n is given by a, a non-zero polynomial. A non-zero polynomial and of degree um, less than or equal to the degree of p. So now, actually, this problem just reduces to some question about, about polynomials over finite fields. So you know, suppose you have f is a, is a polynomial in, in in some variables, I don't know, x1 through, doesn't really matter how many variables there are, um, over a finite field, um, I'll call it fq now instead of calling it k. And suppose you know the degree of f, and suppose you know also that there, that, that, you know, it's not identically zero. There's some vector where this is not zero. Can you then bound below uh, the, um, well, bound above, if you will, the number of zeros? So then you'd like to show, want an upper bound for the number of zeros, or the proportion of zeros, the, the fraction of the elements of k to the mn, which are zeros. We want such an upper bound, uh, which depends only on, on the degree of f. And the answer is yes, uh, the one minus two to the minus degree of f does the trick. And this is not very difficult to prove. I mean, the, the um, kind of, the best you can do is to work over the field with two elements and consider a polynomial which is just a product of degree f different variables like x1 x2 x degree f right and so then there's a then there's a, a one minus two to the minus degree f uh, probability that you'll get zero okay, so that's so that's uh, question one uh now question two or question two prime i should call it we don't know or at least i don't know so I don't, I don't know the answer to question um, uh, two prime. I th think it's, it's sort of an interesting question. Um, but actually, I think that um, to my taste, even more interesting is to 
uh, try to understand. So, I mean, what we're interested in is, is different notions. Uh, so what does it mean? Let me ask the question this way. What does it mean that P inverse of zero is large? So when R is a finite ring, you can express this in terms of the, the fraction of the elements in, in R to the N, which uh, lie in uh, uh, P inverse of zero. Uh, but I think in, in some ways it's more interesting, instead of counting, uh, so instead of counting, uh, we can think about, uh, we can think geometrically Uh, and look at at the co-dimension um, at uh, the co-dimension of the inverse p inverse of zero. Now, I mean, again, um, if you think about R as a uh, finite dimensional, if we think of R as a finite dimensional k vector space. Um, then this is actually just an algebraic variety. If the dimension of R is finite, this is an algebraic variety. And so we can look at its co-dimension. Uh, but in fact, an, an advantage, um, at least um, from my, uh, my point of view, an advantage of this point of view is that in fact, this enables us also to look at the case, the more interesting case probably, when, when R is infinite dimensional. So uh, we can make sense of this even, so even if the dimension of R is infinite, uh, we can make sense, uh, make sense of co-dimension. So I want to say how we do that. Um, so the first, the first point is, so, I mean, this is, um, I mean, there might be other good notions of co-dimension one can think about, but this seems to be reasonably adapted for, for the problem at hand. So, so think about the following situation. So let, let V, forget about the fact that it's an algebra. In fact, V will end up being not R, but, but R to the N in any case. But, but at this point, let V just be a vector space. Okay, vector space. And so we'll say, so let X, inside V be a subset. So we'll say X is of, of finite co-dimension if it contains an affine subspace Of finite co-dimension, so a, a tr uh, translate of a vector subspace of finite co-dimension. So if we just want to know what, whether it's a finite co-dimension or not, this, this is how you answer the question. Now, if you want to actually calculate what the co-dimension is in the case of an infinite dimensional vector space, uh, we can do it the following. So uh, if, um, if V has a, a direct sum decomposition v1 plus v2, where the dimension of v1 is finite, uh, and x1 inside v1 is an algebraic set, or if you want to think of it this way, think of it as an algebraic, I mean, basically think of it as an algebraic variety, sub-variety of v1, uh, then uh, if x contains x1 cross v2, uh, the co-dimension of x is greater than or equal to the co-dimension of x1 in v1, right? So if x1 just consists of a single point, that's what we had when we were talking about an affine subspace, then we would say that the co-dimension of x is, um, is at least the dimension of v1. But it could be that we actually have a positive dimensional variety x1, and x may contain x1 cross v2, in which case we should sort of consider that positive dimensionality of x1 to, to, to cause the co-dimension of x also to be smaller. So that's, 
that's how we make sense of, um, of, of what the co-dimension of a set X is. Okay, and I will say uh, that R is AI uh, for almost polynomial identity if there exists a non-zero P Uh, again, a polynomial in, in variables x1 through xn, uh, not, not identically, well, not, not um, identically zero as a polynomial. Uh, I mean, it may be zero on R, but it, its coefficients are not all zero. If there exists a polynomial like this, um, such that when we take p inverse of zero, uh, the co-dimension of this and when, of course, we're thinking about p inverse of zero as a, as a subspace, of, a, not a linear subspace, it's a subset of r to the n, which we think of just as a k vector space. So um, such that this co-dimension uh, is, uh, is finite. Um, and in fact, we will say uh, r is CAI, C being a parameter, if we can choose uh, can choose P uh, such that the um, the codimension of P inverse of zero is less than or equal to C. So C quantifies uh, how good the almost identity is. Okay, now I can uh, state the main theorem. So the theorem is. If R is AI, then R is actually satisfies a polynomial identity. So this is a kind of a modified version of question, what I called question two prime. Um, and we can say a little bit more than this, actually. Um, so I could, um, so a refinement of this theorem, I would look at what the polynomial is. So um, P is, let's say, C AI. So then we have a particular polynomial in mind and a particular C in mind. So it turns out that um, there exists Q depending a polynomial in, in some number of variables. I'm not going to specify what it is, depending only on the degree of P the number of variables of p and the codimension c uh, such that q is an identity on r. So it doesn't really depend in a very sensitive way on what the polynomial was, just as at the beginning we saw that for the commutator and for x squared, we both ended up getting the, the same kinds of polynomials q. So this just seems to be a feature of this uh, business of going from, from almost identities to actual identities. Um, a corollary of this uh, is the following. Uh, if um, Rn is n by n matrices uh, and Xn is the um, set of, uh, uh, I see, I, I've used uh, n in a, in a different sense, n is the number of variables. Okay, so I should, I should uh, write xm. So this is a subset of, of rm to the n, consisting of n tuples, which satisfy my um, polynomial p. Um, then the co-dimension of xm in the limit as m goes to infinity goes to infinity. That is to say, uh, if I, so this is now a purely finite dimensional statement. If I, if I look at the solution set, uh, if I start off with a polynomial, which is, which is, um, which is not the zero polynomial, and I look at the uh, polynomial at n variables, and, and I look at, at n tuples, um, of m by m matrices, which satisfy the polynomial equation, this co-dimension goes to infinity. 
And the reason that this is true, this follows from um, Amatsur Levitsky, because Amatsur Levitsky tells us that if I fix the degree of a polynomial, that polynomial is not going to hold identically on m by m matrices when m is large enough. So if, it, if these co-dimensions remained bounded, if the co-dimensions remained bounded, then there'd be some bound C, uh, and, and P would be CAI. And so we'd be in this situation where there would exist a Q that worked for all the different uh, rings RM, and that Q would have some bounded degree, and then it, it would violate amateur levitsky okay, So that's how, how the, the corollary is proved. Uh, another corollary uh, using a, a less well-known result of Amatsur is, is the following. So if the Jacobson radical, so now we're going to, to talk again about a case where R may be infinite dimensional. If the Jacobson radical of R is zero and R is uh, almost polynomial, then R is a subdirect sum of uh, central simple algebras of bounded dimension uh, over their centers. So in other words, R embeds in a product of uh, central simple algebras CI in such a way that if you project onto any one of these factors, R surjects onto each of these factors. So R is a, is a, a subring of this product, surjecting onto each factor and the uh, dimension of each of these central simple algebras CJ um, over its center is bounded. So uh, uh, what happened is that Amitsur proved this for uh, polynomial identity uh, uh, rings R. And so since AI implies PI, this is an immediate consequence. And this we will use uh, um, uh, in a minute. But before doing that, I want to um, mention one other thing about the uh, main theorem, which is that, um, it, except at this point um, in the talk, uh, I'm only interested in associative algebras. But in fact, there is an analogous story for the algebra. So let me just say that. So, um, so it makes sense. So we can talk about Lie polynomials being almost identities. Again, it's it's exactly the same uh, definition as before, and. Um, uh, for the algebra is also uh, AI implies PI. Uh, and we can apply this result in, in the same way that we applied the original theorem um, to say that if, if P is a non-trivial Lie polynomial, And we uh, define, I don't know, I guess my notation has to be a little different. Let's say I define uh, XL equals P inverse of zero on the Lie algebra L. Then the limit taken over L simple, all simple Lie algebras of the co-dimension of XL is again infinite. And it's, again, it's exactly the same argument as before. OK, so the, the last thing that I want to talk about is uh, I want to, to sort of go back to the, to the near the beginning of the talk where we were talking about x squared uh, and more generally um, powers of x, so one variable identities as being sort of the, the, uh, a place to, to think about what these theorems actually say. So here, let's, uh, all right, let's talk about the, the case 
where uh, p of x1 through xn is really nothing more complicated than x1 to the m, which I'll just call x to the m. Well, I'll just have one variable. OK, so the first thing which I want to point out is that if r is uh, finite dimensional uh, and the co-dimension of r, uh, the nilpotent set in r, so by r nilpotent, I mean the, the, um, the, the union, if you like, over all m of the zero locus of x to the m. Um, so if the co-dimension of this is less than or equal to c and r is finite dimensional, then uh, r modulo the Jacobson radical is bounded in dimension. And the reason this is true is that for finite dimensional algebras, r modulo the Jacobson radical is just going to be a product of matrix algebras. And we can, if you're in a product of matrix algebras, you can calculate the co-dimension of the nilpotent elements by just adding together the co-dimensions for each of the matrix factors. And we know what the, the co-dimension, uh, we know what the co-dimension uh, of nilpotent elements for n by n matrices would be. It's it's co-dimension n. It's a co-dimension with n by n is equal to n. So if the total co-dimension co is C, that bounds both the size of the of the uh, matrix ring factors and also the number of such factors. Okay, so so this is this doesn't require any uh, you know uh, anything that we've done uh, up till now. Uh, but now I want to look at what happens um, in the infinite dimensional case. And so now I'm going to, instead of looking at all the nilpotent um, uh, elements, I'm just going to fix an M. And so the, the uh, theorem which I want to say is, is the following. Um, again, this is okay from there. Uh, if X to the M is an almost identity of R, where now again, R may be infinite dimensional, then modulo Jacobson radical. Um, this is finite dimension. So here we're not quite saying what we would like to say, which is that we have an actual, um, well, I don't know. What we, we're not quite saying what we have been saying previously, which is that we have an actual um, uh, identity. We're saying something actually a, a, maybe in some ways more interesting, we're saying that R is in a different sense. Um, well, I'm not asserting that J, that J of R is nilpotent at this point, but what I would like, okay, but maybe I'll, I'll combine the two theorems because I, I keep on wanting to talk about the, um, so if X to the M is an almost identity of R, and R is finally generated as an algebra, then um, R is virtually nilpotent. So it's almost as if we're saying, not quite because I have to fix M, but it's almost as if I, I'm saying that if, if a lot of elements are nilpotent, then the ring as a whole is virtually nilpotent. So that's, that's sort of what we're, what we're um, you know, the direction of what we look like. Okay, so why why are these things true? Uh, let me look at time. Uh, let's see. Um, no, I think I'm out of time, and I I, but I started. Yeah, I started forty minutes ago. So I'll I'll just stop here. Thank you very much. Um, Thanks very much uh, for for your talk. Um, if anyone has um, a quick question, we we can deal with it. And, well, and well, then, ah, okay. Um, um, Michael, would you like? <laughs> ah, okay. The the question was where was it published? <laughs> Uh, I think it's proceeding. I think it it it's supposed to appear in proceedings of the AMS, but maybe hasn't yet done so. Is that do you do you remember? I mean, it, what way do you 
Archive. Uh, archive. Uh, he's asking about the archive. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, you. It is in the archive. Um, uh, I, I could give you a number, but I mean, you can find it as easily as I can. So, um, it, it, I'm pretty sure it's in the archive. Am I, am I there, wrong? There are, there, are, there are actually two papers, and they're both in the archive. I think. Yeah, I mean, mainly, mainly I talked about. Okay, let me since since I'm right since I know what the paper is. Uh, yeah, so let me just um, it's easy enough for me to just just look it up. Uh, uh, so math archive. Uh, so yeah, let's see. The title of the paper is um, Almost PI Algebras are PI, and the archive number is, well, 1910. You know, maybe I'll put, just put it in chat. That's the way to do it. So let me just cut and paste it into chat. Uh, yeah. So, um, I to put everybody. Uh, other questions? Uh, can yeah. something similar be done for uh, commutative algebras and also for p groups? So p groups, I think, would be great. I'd love, I'd, I'd love to to do this for p groups um, if I could. Um, so commutative algebras. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I mean, are there I mean, the, the, yeah, so I don't know. I, I have to think about it and I don't know the answer. Um, I'm sort of doubtful that there's something interesting to say about commutative algebras, but, but maybe there is. In your last theorem, um, if you assume characteristic zero, do you think you could get that the algebra is no potent? Um, so I, I am, I, I, I mean, there are, real PI experts here, and um, maybe they could. Uh, I couldn't. I'm really an amateur in this business. OK, um, um, so if there are no questions, uh, um, let's um, thank Michael and all the speakers today. And uh, you are invited to the reception, those of you who are here. <laughs>